subscribe to the Danny Houston Podcast, man. This panel started with getting ready to move into the 2000s. Shout out to everybody that's been on the panels before now. I'm, I'll call you up. I'll call you up. Thanks to everybody that's been on the panels right now. I know it's not easy trying to tell these stories in this, this short little time that we have dedicated, but we appreciate everybody's input. I got me a fresh drink. Don, you got a fresh drink? Jazz over there full. You been eating them burgers, trill burgers. It's nap time now. All right, let's go ahead and get started, my brother. Let's do it. So we're going to get into these 2000s, man. Let's do it. I'm excited about the 2000s, you know what I'm saying? That's when um, I first started getting caught unk and feeling old and shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about this one. Um, Coming to the stage first, legendary DJ, one half of the Hollywood boys in here, um, highly respected in his Kappa, uh, in his Kappa family. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please come to the stage, Mr. DJ Aggravated in the building. He's a he's a he's a, he's a budding a budding social media influencer by the way so stay tuned. <laughs> up next we would like to bring up the two co-founders of Swisher House Records. True. From the music side, esteemed, highly regarded and respected DJ, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Five Thousand Watts. And on the visionary side, the business angle, like I said, the money man, we always got to give respect to the money man. Please welcome the CEO, G Dash, to the stage. And then we're going to bring up two artists, man. Um, Represent Mo City, the Mo City Don, Zero. Zero with a building. Yeah. Okay, we'll he'll, wait on He'll be coming up shortly. And then also, we're going to bring up, represent Cloverland, the Leprechaun, the Freestyle King, Lil Flip. I think, I think Flip and Zero. They together? They, that, that makes sense. Uh-huh. They probably outside smoking. We'll give them a second. We can get started. Aggravated. You come from some of the earliest um, initiations of, yeah, of yeah, iterations, yeah. excuse me, of Rap A Lot Records. You were, you know, there for a lot of the early recordings. You were the, the original DJ for the Convicts with Big Mike at 3-2. Um, with hip hop moving into the 2000s, what did you see in the culture that you knew was going to work as we move forward? And what were some of the things that you felt like we had to improve on? Well, first of all, uh, this is great that y'all put this together. I tell him he's a historian as well as blast and everything. Thanks. Shout out to all the, uh, the DJs that are actually in here because it, it was the DJs that are actually in here that are doing it, that are part of Houston uh, uh, pioneers and just helping Houston move forward. As far as the 2000s, that's what we got through with the 90s. Um, a lot of things was happening in radio where we were trying, they were trying to figure it out, right? So everything was working in the 90s and the 2000s, they were figuring out, hey, Houston, Houston's got something. So, you know, we were still, me and Blast would still be going to all these mix show power summits along with uh, G and all them. The hardest thing was trying to get everybody else to understand that Houston had the, we had our shit. We, we had a lot of shit going on, you know? Whether it was, uh, you know, 
you guys coming before that, helping to push it forward. Then in the 2000s, when you had all these other rappers coming in, you know, your, your Mike Jones and everybody, now they're, now they're hot. Now telling these New York DJs, they still didn't want to play it. I remember just sitting in a bunch of uh, meetings or things with me and Blast, and we, we're coming in, let them know, hey, the South is coming. We, we got the 90s, but these other cats slimming on them, they coming. And I just remember, like, well, I'm part of the heavy others. We'd be on a conference call, and I'm telling them every week, I'm introducing new, new rappers to them. Like, hey, y'all need to check this guy. Y'all need to check this guy. Y'all need to check this guy. You know, they all, and it's, we got a bunch of DJs. So all of them wouldn't really own it, but a few would be on it. But it was really hard to introduce them to the newer part of, 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 Houston 2000 rap because they was, they was used to, you know, the 90s, they used to ghetto boys. But moving forward, when you saw having your Slim Thugs and everybody else that was coming along, they were still kind of leery, but we were still pushing it forward, especially me and we were still pushing it forward like, hey guys, this, can, this works. This works not just in the South, because the South was playing it, but no one else was playing it. But we were trying to push it forward every chance we got. And it was hard because they were still looking at us like whatever. But we was, every chance we get, we would try to push it forward. And, and I want to say, anytime we would go out of town and DJ places, we would pretty much just bring a Houston crate. Yeah. We were like, y'all already got the New York stuff. Y'all don't know about this, you know, or even South stuff, Master P. We was, yeah. doing, we was trying to do the whole thing. So they bring us out to Howard Homecoming, baby, oh, yeah. it's South Side oh, yeah. time. Yeah. We in Cancun DJing, it's Top Drop time. You yeah. know, that's what we would do everywhere we would go. We always make sure we brought so, Texas with it's us. It's so crazy when we were in Cancun and we got our name put up on a thing, right? And people were walking up and they're like, oh, we know them. They thinking we finna come in and play. We coming in there playing anything from Houston or the South. And especially if it was in the South and Houston, we playing it, we playing it. We, we was trying to push the needle forward to show them that, hey, we here and we doing something. Now at this time, you know, Houston scene is starting to evolve. Um, DJ Screw Sound set us out into the, the country and then, you know, different artists, Rec Shop is releasing artists, some different artists from Screwed Up Click are coming out. When did you guys see that it was time for y'all to take a chance on getting into this mix and, and, and really taking things from a mixtape angle to like actually releasing full length albums and, and really building up Swisher House as a label? All right, check this out. First of all, before I answer that question, right? It's a lot of confusion going on around here, right? I started on Switch House in 96, right? I started making some mixtapes in 96. Switch House is a company that I own. I own the company and I own the brand. Now, we started making albums in the 2000s, right? The Day Hell Broke Loose One, that was the first Switch House commercial record. I put that record out, that was on the Switch House. Now everything after that, me and Dash teamed up and made Swisher Blast. Now we're partners in Swisher Blast we're co-owners of Swisher Blast, you know? That's one thing that a lot of people don't understand and don't know, you know? So a lot of these albums that you hear out there, the Mike Jones and the Paul Walls and the Big Tykes and all these big albums that went platinum, those are Swisher Blast albums. So it started off with the Swish House and the mixtapes. That's what I created and I brought it to the table around here. And Swisher Blast is the company that me and him are partners on that made all these beautiful multi-platinum albums here for H-Town. I love it. And, and that's I just wanted to important. get that clear because I know a lot of people don't know exactly what our relationship is and how we working on that, but I wanted everybody to understand that and know. And see, that's what this event is about. This is about making sure that the true history of our culture is told by us and not other people. You know what I'm saying? Other people can control the media, and if you, but they can't control the narrative if we're the ones that tell the story. You know what I'm saying? If we tell the story enough, they can't manipulate the story. So I appreciate you for that clarity. When did y'all decide, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna take this from these mixtapes to these albums, um, when did y'all decide, okay, we're going to have to step this game up. We got to do this different. Well, basically, the mixtapes were really blowing out of the frame. We was actually selling mixtapes all over the United States. Right. You know, and the mixtapes got so popular and the artists got so hot that we had to make an album. So I put out the Day Hell Broke Loose One. That album did great numbers, and we ended up uh, getting a deal. So Jay Prince jumped in, right? 
He didn't, and, uh, meet, he didn't meet you in, on the, in the parking lot, did he? No, <laughs> no, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't meet us in the parking yeah, lot, okay. right? Because he, he met everybody else in the parking lot. No, no, no. I met him at the compound. Okay. It, it is advanced. This is 2000, so, you know, it wasn't the 90s when all y'all met him and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Watch, you're moving a little too fast. Yeah, go ahead. We dropped that. We dropped Archie Lee, Big Tiger, Day Hill broke loose two, first round draft picks, and all freestyles five as commercial releases before yeah. we even got the deal. But yeah. that's so as we, an independent label. So we're doing straight good independently. Yeah. Yeah. Major a major deal. Yeah, that was, that, was our, that was our slogan at the time. Not to cut you we, off, y'all dropped CDs. It was the transition from tapes to CDs. Yeah, that's correct. Hey, I'm going to tell y'all something that a lot of people don't know, right? We was the one, well, I was the first one to drop a bootleg mix, slow down, and chop CD. Like and to play on the CD. Yeah, yeah. So in, in like 98 <laughs> and stuff like that, we was making underground CDs instead of tapes. So, right. were, you, so were y'all burning CDs or yes. were y'all getting them manufactured? Yeah, no, no, no. We're burning them. <laughs> we're just cooking them up. And you know what I mean? But you said bootleg. I just want to be clear. Yeah, I don't want to be honest with you because a lot of people didn't know that. You know, because like, uh, you know, Screw went commercial when he did the, uh, the, the three in the morning. Mm -hmm. But before that, we was doing underground mix CDs. We switched it from the slow down game from cassettes and we uh, brought it up into the CD era. And we started doing that like in 98. 98. So when 2000 comes and y'all get the deal, yeah. Y'all realize y'all got this major platform. How do y'all decide how to separate Swisher House from everybody else? Not, not necessarily in Houston, because it's obvious y'all are a Houston record company. But what do y'all think? Like, what do we need to do for this company to make sure we set ourselves apart from everybody else that's doing this right now? Well, the deal actually came in 2004, at the end of 2004, because we had an album called Day Hill Broke Loose 2 that had the single still tipping on it. We shot the video to it, because like I said, our slogan was major without a major deal, so we was trying to do everything that the majors was doing, but doing it on an independent platform. We never wanted the deal. But when we did get the deal, we decided to keep still tipping because that song had momentum already. And down here in Texas, they really didn't even want to play it anymore. So we had to do a remix, which had Kiki and Pokey on it. Yeah, so. That kind of catapulted us to the next level. And I, I love the fact that, you know, because at the time there was division in the city, you know what I'm saying, between the south side and the north side. Y'all made a concerted effort to try to bridge that gap. You know what I'm saying? Why, why did you feel y'all needed to do that? I'll answer that. <laughs> I'm hate blind. I'm hate blind. I don't pay attention to nothing but the culture. I only care about us. I don't give a damn what nobody say. I don't give a fuck about how nobody feel. My thing is this. We're stronger if we're connected. So if I got to push the button to show people this around here, I feel like that is more important than uh, me having feelings about uh, a certain side of town or anything like that because I feel like good music is good music. And especially if it's here from Houston and it represents us, I feel like it should be played. Yeah. And I think the Plex was more about the people that was around the artists. It wasn't necessarily the artists because we worked with a lot of Southside artists like when we was independent, while the beef was going on. Right. I remember paying Flip to get on the Big Tiger album. So. I don't even know why that was even a beef. You know what I'm saying? Cause it, it, you know what, but I think it was more it, street. It's always people that's yeah. in the middle yeah. of these things, right? Typically when the heads can talk, yeah. you know what I'm saying, things tend to go away, but it's always the people underneath that keep the bullshit up, typically. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly, exactly. exactly. Now, now, at this, now at this time with the Swisher House, right? The, the first generation of Switch House people have already made their names through the tapes. They just start releasing full length albums, you know what I'm saying? Flip, you came up under the Botany Boys, which I think is a very underrated um, contributor to yes, Houston Hip Hop. Right, they don't get their props, yes. Shout out to my, my boys C Note and Will and Red. You Pretty came up note. as a Botany BG at the time. Being that second generation of Screwed Up Click, and you seeing the Screwed Up Click, right. you know, Pat got out, Hulk, everybody got music. Switcher House is releasing music. Switcher Blast is selling millions of records. As a second generation, what were you looking at thinking like, man, I know we here, but I think we can start taking this shit there. 
Well, I, I got family on the north side, so I used to always be on the north side, Fifth Ward, Studi Wood. So when the north side and the south side beef was going on, it ain't never affect me. Cause I was over there in Rosewood with Lil Run and the Burberry <laughs> Jag, you know what I'm saying? Like I was always on the north side, so I never got caught up in the north side, south side beef, you know what I'm saying? And I, I did go over there and do it. My biggest freestyle, even though I'm in a screwed up clip, my biggest freestyle is I-45, we blow in though with Ron C on the Swisher House tape. So I used to be at Ron C House, me and Big Shasta. I'm on Big Tiger album. I'm on a few Swisher House albums, you know? So I just thought, I felt like all the people that came before me, I had to motherfucking pass, the, you know, carry the torch that they passed me, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, seeing what Jay Prince did on the north side, turned the, the car lot to, you know what I mean? Because my dad sold cars, too. So he, my dad taught me a lot of shit when it come to marketing. And when I was doing double albums and I'd be at concerts and everybody selling their mixtapes, I'm giving mine away. They're like, man, you should be selling your shit. I'm like, nah, I'm finna get this shit away. And then when I come back, they go know this shit. So why everybody was, you know, they'll probably sell 20 tapes. I'm giving away 200, 300. I'm going to all the towns that everybody told me to skip. Because a lot of times people tell you to skip the towns that don't have BDS radio stations. Right. Man, I'm going to the college stations. I'm going to the country towns. I'm taking pictures. So everything everybody didn't want to do, I'm Hollywood. I'm not Hollywood. So I just feel like. The people that came before me, what I learned from Screw, him selling the mixtapes, me going to car shows with him, seeing them make their money, you know, I, I, I'm a sponge, so I just soaked up the game and coming after the Bonnie Boys, you know, they brought a, a damn helicopter to Cloverland Park. They had records with cash money before people had records with cash money. You know what I mean? If you go back to cash money, you'll see before they started hanging with C-Note and stuff, they only had golds in their mouth. When they see we had diamonds in our mouth, they changed their shit. So, you know, Cloverland, we real trendsetters, and I just always felt like I got to make the people proud who came before me. You know, uh, Screw passed away, you know, in late 2000. But when you talk about Screwed Up Click, you know, we right. had Kiki on. He was, you know, coming up in the 90s. After Screw passed, it was like, you know, you and Zero, y'all both really came up. Like, we both heard y'all for the first time, like, 98, 99. You know right. What I mean? Diamonds in your face, buy the car, buy the house, and right. the Screw Look tape. at what you did to and me. Yeah, look what you rise, did to me. All that, you know what I'm Correct. saying? Correct. But, Ro, can you talk about, because... You know, Zero versus the World, I feel like that was like more of a, a serious breakout solo album where everybody knew. If you didn't know Zero before, you knew exactly who Zero was when Zero versus the World came out. And, you know, Screw was supposed to do a, a version of that as well, right? But he passed away. Can you talk a little bit about that and then also how you just took the game to another level after that, man? Yeah. <clears throat> Shit, my bad. Uh, okay. <laughs> Drunk. Anyway, uh, <laughs> swim well. <laughs> my bad, bun. My bad, my bad. Now, uh, yeah, man, uh, Zero versus the World. When I got the, I got the, the CD from Din Din. You know, I got it, and I was like, damn, this, this nigga from the hood, which is the Two Minute Nigga song. Screws like, yeah, man, I need the vinyl for this. I need the vinyl for this so I can you know, I can put it on the dub. You know, I'm fresh in the screwed up click. I think it was like me and Flip and that was it. So yep. I'm, I'm like, I'm the new nigga. So I'm like, shit, I got little boys know I can do something. So uh, I got a call, Din Din called me. He was like, hey man, two things. Your vinyl came in, five songs on it. You know, the song with Hawk. Uh, and then the two many niggas, he was like, yeah, so your vinyl came in, but also they just found Screw dead, too. So the day the vinyl came in, it was the day Screw left. That's why you ain't never got a chopped up too many niggas featuring Big Mo. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that shit sucked. And, uh... And honestly, I don't even remember your other question. What was the other question? <laughs> no, I was gonna say, what was it about? Cause you know, Screw was a, was a driving factor for a lot of people. You know, once he touched your record, a lot of times you were out of here, but he passed away, you know, in the middle of you having your moment. <laughs> My bad. If y'all, whoever in the back would do hey, something. Hey man, no more drinks for Ro, man. No more drinks for the cookie, shit. man. Hell, I need another one of these motherfuckers though. <laughs> but, but what happened on shit? No, nah, I was saying, man, what was it about, you know, did, did that have anything in you to put a battery in your back to be like, man, you know, Screw was was a, was a guy who was really gonna help me out in this thing, even though you had your thing going on. But like you said, you just took it to that next level. Did you ever 
you know, feed off of that. Like, man, you know what I'm saying? It's on me now, and I got to make this thing happen. So it was like you just kept mashing Zero versus the World, King of the Ghetto, Zero. It was like we just got all these albums, and that's when you really, you know, made your name. I ain't want to get no job. I ain't even work for nobody. Message. My attitude too bad. Uh, <clears throat> I did some little season shit for a little while. You know, pan, pan, meet to meet to. And, uh, <laughs> shit. Meet to meet to. I worked at Video Square. That shit was gay to the motherfucker too. So, <laughs> shit. Really, really, the reason I decided to do music full time was because of, because of d -Rick. Like I was, you know, no disrespect to Din Din or nobody straight profit, but I mean, you know, I was, I was getting my rent paid. But Rick was like, hey, I want you to come over here and help us write some songs. And Rick gave me some real money. I was like, shout out to Rick. Oh, shout yeah. out to the money man. Yeah. <laughs> For real, like he gave me some, like the first zeros I seen. And I was like, <laughs> besides right me in the mirror, it was the first zero. <laughs> And I was like, you finna give me this for every song I write? Yeah. And this is Big Mo's album, right? Yeah. yeah. See, that nigga Big Mo's like, slow down. I'm like, you don't understand what this nigga paying me. <laughs> yeah. I'm not finna slow down. <laughs> I live in an efficiency right now. And this shit ain't even efficient, so I'm finna keep doing this shit. So that's why, I mean, I'm being honest. That's why I did that shit, because... You know, and the efficiency turned into a highest and then a two-story and then on it, you know, but that's why I did that shit, because I ain't want to work for nobody. Uh, I'm anti-social, but I got the most social-ass job, so it's fucked up. So, but I was kind of good at that shit. So, I mean, I kept doing the shit, and I knew, like, if, if I lacked off of it, I'd give somebody else to come, you know, a chance to come in and bump me off my, my pedestal, so. I just kept slapping y'all upside the head with music every time I felt like it. Yeah. Yeah, now, Flip, Flip, you were one of the first of your generation to, to have a platinum album, to do national tours, and have this major exposure in your earliest days of your career. Leaving Houston and having to really go out in the world and make your bones at a time where you were probably one of the few Houston artists that was being in, in, included in a lot of these national conversations, concerts, and, and, and things like that. What was it like representing Houston at that time where you were probably one of the few people, and then of course Mike and Paul and, and Cam, everybody kind of came around that same time, but you were one of the first ones to really have that big record outside of that kind of system because you didn't necessarily come up under Swisher House or you didn't come up under the Screwed Up Click. You kind of made your own way. What was it like for you as a young independent artist going out there and making it, man? I just felt like me having a blueprint, like what Jay Prince did, seeing what he did with his company and, you know, going to the car shows and seeing how they deep and got the Rolls Royces and all that, you know, my family, Black Panthers and you know, boxes and sports, so I just looked at it like, okay, he's spending his own money, Face doing videos with Scarface, I used to be at Club Oasis, watching the, you know, going to the Face Mob concerts, I went to Fundra Middle School with Tulo, you know what I mean, so we was in detention together, you know, chopping it up, so, free Tulo, by the way, but like, me seeing Tulo make it, you know, I was a fan of Criss Cross and all that, but you know, they from Atlanta. So I'm going to Fungin Middle School and I'm at school with Tulo, so seeing what he was doing, it, it motivated me. I'm like, all right, so let me soak up the game like a sponge. Let me apply what I learned from my dad selling cars and being able to give away music. So one of the main reasons why I dropped double albums, you know, I found out that, hey, if you drop a double album, all you gotta sell is 250 to go gold. So, you know, 8-Ball, when he dropped his first solo album, you know, it was a triple album. You know what I mean? Lost was a triple album. Yeah. So he ain't had to sell that many to go platinum. You know what I mean? So my mind frame was like, all right, let me apply the hustle game. Let me be a people's person. Let me go and fuck with the people because I come from a family of musicians. So a lot of people, they wonder how I made it. My grandmother, she played the piano for the choir. So if you're born in my family, you sing it in the choir. So I played the drums, I played the piano. So stage shy, stage fright, that shit ain't, I don't know what that is. So I was already doing music for God. So once I found out I could make money by doing rap battles and traveling, I'm like, all right, let me go cover as much ground 
I, um, I might not get what I want for a show, but hey, I'd rather cover much ground as I can. So my motto was like, all right, let me go to the East Coast. So before I signed my deal, I was already doing shows in New York. I was already linking up with people like 50 Cent and Killer Cam because my whole mind frame was like, if I'm gonna take over somebody's city, I need to go collaborate with who's running the city. So you running this city, I'm finna come rap next to you and show them I can hold my own, and I ain't give a damn, I'ma represent Texas no matter where I'm at. You know, I'ma I'm a still shout out DJ Screw, I'ma be Hollywood, I ain't finna sell my soul, I ain't finna do no weird shit to make it, cause I don't love money. Yeah, I'm used to the attention. You know, you go back to my yearbooks, fly shoes, women, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> when I made it in the rap game, this, that's why I'm so laid back, cause it sent me not on me, church. There you go. There it is. Now, Swisher Blast at this time, it seems like everything y'all drop is either going gold or platinum. Like, y'all making a lot of noise. And this minor movement as a major is actually starting to work for y'all as a company. What do y'all attribute to being able to take such advantage of the industry at that time? Like, y'all were obviously making good music, but everybody that makes good music doesn't go gold or platinum. You know right. what I'm saying? What was it that that you guys had in your formula to make sure that your artists could go as far as y'all wanted them to go at that time. Oh, God. God. Hey, man, won't he do it? There we go. <laughs> and also the ability to keep hustling and grinding like you're independent, even though you're on a major. Don't wait on them to do anything for you. Take the initiative and go ahead and do everything yourself because they'll take their time on you. They'll try to see True. if you're going to... Uh, 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 move the needle for yourself before they just jump on. And that's a, a lot of times that's what the majors like to do. They like to jump on once, the, once they get to rolling. Now we got a lot of independent artists in here who may one day be looking to make that same kind of transition from an independent to a major label deal. What are some things that they need to go when they go into negotiation? Like what do they need to know when they're dealing with these people? And what do they need to avoid when they're dealing with these people? Honestly, I tell them to stay independent. And why do you think well, that's a better option? Because you control your own destiny. You don't have to wait for them to tell you when to drop, what to drop. Uh, sometimes they shelve you. Yep. I mean, before you even negotiate with anybody, first of all, you need to know what your worth is. Because if you don't know what your worth is, you can't negotiate anything. Message. I hope y'all are listening to this. I see Message. a lot of young up and coming artists in there. I hope hey, let me let me tell you something real fast. Because in the two thousands now, once these guys came along and pushed us way, you know, further ahead and made us sound really good. As far as uh, when they were talking about getting songs on the radio, it was easier for them to get songs in airplay, right? Because for the most part, like when we were with rap -A -Lot and all that, when rap -A -Lot was dropping all that stuff, most of the stuff we used to have to only play during mix show, right? So we could only play in a mix show. So I remember getting a whole, like, a whole bunch of wax from them, and we could only play those songs during the mix show, right? So that's the only time those people would get played, like William Blaster, we'd, we would sit, we didn't even talk to, like when I, so when I started in 92 and I was, Ron Atkin was my, my program director, I maybe spoke, I spoke to him every day, but he wouldn't even talk to me really, right? So then the next PD came along and then it was like, all right, me and, no, me and Blaster would come out of the, 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 uh, the, the program meeting or whatever, and they're not even talking about what we playing. Me and him would just look at each other and go, hey, what you playing? Hey, I'm gonna play this, hey, did uh, Chief don't give you that other uh, stuff? Yeah, cool, I'm gonna play that, I'm gonna play this, and we gonna play it. They didn't even check for us, but we could only play it on the weekends. Now when they, when this moved forward, now we, it's, it's open, right? So now they're on the radio, you know, and they're talking to the mix, mix, uh, uh, the mix show. And mix show is not just a mix show, just for, the underground, whatever, they're getting pushed forward. Everybody's getting played. And a lot more Houston stuff is getting played because they were telling, they were pushing for us to play other stuff, but we were too busy trying to play our Houston stuff too and, and a lot of underground stuff. And I tell you, me and Blaster and JQ and, and G, we pushed, try to push the limit on that, just play a lot of stuff that even wasn't even like an album cut. Like I remember playing Scarface album cut and just editing it live on the air, but <laughs> yeah, get in trouble for that. But once they pushed the envelope forward, it was easier. It was open. You could go talk. I could go talk to a program director. Like, hey, 
the streets are talking about such and such, such and such. What's up with it? Now, they might not hear me right then. I'm like, I bet. Cool. Come back two weeks later. Hey, the streets are talking about Flip. This song right here. Don't play that. This the song. No, no, no. All right, cool. You, labels are telling y'all to play that song. This the song, though. This could be the, this could be the Houston song. They can play that other stuff, but this could be the Houston song. So these guys pushed it forward to make it easier to play on the radio. It was much harder in the 90s, so we had to play the mix show only. Now, I want to call an audible, Donnie, and the reason I want to do that is because in this era of hip-hop, we had not only a transition from the artistry, but also from the presentation. A big part of that was the artwork. In the 2000s, the artwork got very flamboyant. It caught everybody's eye. And a big part of that was one of the people that's in the audience right now. Mike, can, would, Mike you, would you mind coming up here? Mike Frost. For a minute. Mike Frost. Yes, yeah, absolutely, man, absolutely. <laughs> Mike, Mike Frost, sure. for many of you, is the designer behind many of the memorable Ace town and hip-hop in general album covers. He's responsible basically for the transition in just a basic portrait shot of an artist for an album cover into having many more details that spoke to the personality of the artist, the neighborhood they came from, the, the image that the label wanted to have. Mike, can, do you remember when you were first approached about designing check, check. a rap album cover? Man, so, so I, I actually started in punk rock, and then I used to go to the rave parties, right? And I was into computers, like my parents got me a computer, like, and I just, I grew up golfing Bank 45, so they like, but the first time I was approached was by my friend Orbit, who does videos and stuff now. Orbit Shout did out to Orbit. So we went to high school together, and he was, uh, I had a t-shirt press in my garage, and he would come up, and like, he's like, man, you know Photoshop, I want to make shirts. So he was, we were designing and selling t-shirts at the high school football games, but later Wait, on- Wait, was this for Orbit's group? Was this, was, was this well, Quickie it, Nonsense? Or? About, about three months later, Orbit came, and it was like, I'm, you know, he's in a group kamikaze. He's like, hey, do my cover. But I'm, you know, I'm des design. I'm trying to make a comic book. I'm designing all other graphic stuff. I'm like, all right, fuck it, let's do it. So yeah, I made that cover, and then Russell, Big Time Washington, came to me from that. Like I, I never even marketed, or any. I, I didn't even understand what marketing was at that point. But uh, Russell came to me, and like people just started coming to me. And I did this cover for Kick North Bandits on the North Side, some Hispanic guys. And g -Dad saw that, and then Orbit broke down like the whole, he's like, Northside, this is all that's going on, which was a whole new world to me. I was like, I was like, really? This is like going on in the city? This is like crazy. <laughs> so, you know, I just wanted to do art for music. And kind of like Scarface said, I wanted to be the best at whatever I did. Um, but I kind of just followed my heart. But off of... Uh, you know, I was off Westheimer, like this little office on the curve, and G-Dash came up to me, and uh, he brought the Archie Lee album. And uh, I just, I man, I, like I said, I follow what, what, what my heart wanted to do. I wanted to be in music. Like, I, I was just like everybody else in the city. I was like a, a, a kid from modest means that had big dreams. Didn't know how I was gonna make it. I couldn't go anywhere else. Like we, we, and that's one thing I love about Houston rap and I love about it is we had to create the, the world we want here. We had to create something for ourselves. And uh, I've learned even so much about my own history from everybody that came before me just this, this fucking night that I, I didn't even know. But one of the things I know is like, we all got the same attitude. Like we, we're gonna make it, we're gonna kick the door in. Like, we're gonna go after our dreams, but yeah, no, g has came to me at, at the office with the uh, Archie Lee Project. Do you know at this point how many different artists you have designed for in hip hop? I've done over a thousand covers. Oh, okay. And uh, I, I don't know, I run around tonight like, you know, I, one of my bucket list, list things was UGK. And the first time I met you, I, I was drunk as fuck <laughs> at some club, but... Not zero drunk, but still drunk. No, I was, I, I was way more fucked up than zero. <laughs> but the UGK album was actually the, the first rap album from our region that actually got me back into, like, just got me into rap, period. Because I, I was like, went for NWA, all heavy metal, but it was a UGK uh, Riding Dirty album that... 
That. So that's always been my bucket list. Man, that's, that's dope. I, I, I can't imagine what a UGK cover by, by you would have looked like. That would have like, been crazy. That would have been dope. Zero, let me pull you out of this drunk and stupid for Rota. a <laughs> He got his bottle of water with him. He might be a little so, bit better shape. So Boy. one thing that we have in common is that I, I too, am not naturally a people person. And I ended up, like you, picking the worst job in the world to have when you're not that type of person. And for many years, I was able to kind of float under the radar because Pimp was the more outgoing, flamboyant person. Um, but then, uh, as we started to get, become more and more famous, the group itself became famous and bigger than anything we could have ever thought we would have become. At this point, I am hard pressed to pick another record as the anthem of Houston over Mo City Dawn. I would argue that it's the easiest way to tell if a motherfucker from out of town. You know what I'm saying? Right. If you in a group of people, in a room full of people, and you say slow, loud, banging, all in my truck, if you don't say that shit, I, I got you. I know you from out of town. You the folks. You the people. You know what I'm saying? For somebody that was so introverted and so against the idea of being that person, when did you realize you was that nigga in Houston? And that you, there was nothing you could do about it, you couldn't hide from it, you couldn't, you know, stay in the background no more, you was that nigga in Houston. When did you realize that and how did you deal with it? Yeah. I ain't never realized it. <laughs> I mean, I, I heard you say some shit on the radio one day about, man, uh, I don't know what it was, it wasn't a rodeo yet, it was some other car show or some shit, and you was like, I ain't gonna even try to do your voice, but you know. <laughs> I heard it, I, in 97, you was like, yeah man, the king, he, he just don't know. He know you got, I was like, man, but I'm showing love, but I was like, I hate that fucking song. <laughs> I don't like that song at all. Like, Why, I, why not? Because you have to do it so much? Nah, because, well first of all, that whole too long pause, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's too long pause, and there's no hook, there's nowhere to pause. So once we start, most of the dawn, yeah. we going all the way to my motherfucking mule. We gotta go all the way yeah. <laughs> to the end of the song. Yeah. So that's that's first, and then like it ain't talking about like it's like it's jamming, but I ain't talking about shit. I thought it was gonna be another song on the album. I was on, I was on that, you know, that police brutality shit, and and I was like, I was high, I was high as fuck, I was, I was leaning. I think I might have been on some sand bars. I'm starting, I'm starting to sense a pattern, my nigga. I'm yeah, to, yeah. yeah, I was definitely, I was definitely, my cheese hadn't slid off my omelet. Like I was fucked up. Yeah. And if you listen to the song, you know I was fucked up. Queen, you got my phone. Can you make a note with that cheese slid out of my arm? <laughs> Look, I want to tell that to a nigga one day. Hey, but I want to say something about this record because I remember when uh, uh, International Red brought the record to the Hollywood Boys show on the box. Yeah. We was doing Monday through Friday, 10 to 1 every night. And he brings it, it's like a burned CD, and it say Mo City Don. I say, first of all, I'm the Mo City Don. Because you're from Mo City. I'm from Mo City. What is this? Who that is? <laughs> we we got to do some Mo City picture later. I'm, I'm from Ridgemont, man. Uh, Ridge, Ridgemont. Yes, sir. You be, you be Ridge Rod Lane, baby. You be uh, that. that was a long time ago. <laughs> but when me and Aggravate listened to that record, I was like, man, this shit is incredible. And we played it that night, and that's not something that ever really happens on the radio. You don't just bring a record oh, and dope. play it immediately. It's at night, the office is closed, we not able to reach, you know, we not for the call the program director. But that's how hot that record was. I was like, we gotta play this tonight. While Red is in here, I was like, we playing this wide, before he leaves, we are playing this record. And I was like, I need the instrumental, I need the acapella, I need the, we went through the whole thing with it. So I just had to speak on that. That, that was such a huge, and still a huge record. But it was instant hit, and that is not something that happens very often at all in music for a DJ. That was an instant hit. We want to thank our panelists up on the stage today. We literally have 15 minutes left in the venue. So I want to thank our panelists from 2000. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank buddy. you. Y'all, uh, thank y'all so much thank for your contributions to this man. culture. We believe. Uh, we're not gonna play a musical. Well, you can play a couple of songs, but I need everybody to stay in their seats because we're gonna switch this panel out right now and go straight into the last panel. Subscribe to the Danny Houston podcast, man.